Um, yeah, I'm a consultant with ACOM, um, and I've spent most of my consultancy career working on large infrastructure projects of one type or another, whether it's road schemes, Crossrail, or more recently HS2. And just before we kind of go into the more workshop bit, I was asked to speak about kind of a consultant's view, someone who prepares and reviews WSIs, and perhaps drill down into the actual document and how you can you know, convey and write a WSL, WSI well. So as a consultant, I kind of often occupy different roles. So it can be a designer, just the designer, producing a WSI that's going to be costed and implemented on behalf of a client. Um, we can be a technical advisor, reviewing the work of our clause contractors, looking for compliance um, and technical quality, or we can be in a monitoring role. So, you know, our clause called Clarker Works, where we use the WSI as that benchmark, that measure against the quality of the work on site, against progress, and obviously when it comes to cost and program change and remeasuring. So just in preparing, I went back over the standards of guidance and the sections on WSIs. And as someone who generally these days tends to review WSIs, sort of trying to find key points that stood out to me is what was important. You know, we've heard from planning archaeologists um, and funders, that's what they're looking for. So a few points, these aren't necessarily the be all and end all, they might not be right for everybody, but someone who reviews WSI, these were kind of what stood out. Um, so setting out the proposed scheme of investigation in sufficient detail, we've already seen that this morning. Um, ensuring the works will be appropriate and proportionate, certainly. Uh, I think as Matt was saying, he's looking for that in WSIs that he reviews. Um, that contains sufficient detail, provide a benchmark. So we're, in our role as a consultant, we often have to do that. Um, and then the WSI should also set out the research objectives. That's been touched on already this morning, and we will look at that. Um, to give full consideration of all available and practical methods of investigation. Set out measurable data, almost assumptions of cost, um, are based then justifiable post-tender requalification. That's, as a consultant, often plays a part in what we do. And then to give consideration to the inclusion of appropriate contingency arrangements. So, how do you write a WSI with purpose and context? It's really the why. Why is the work happening? Why are you following these methods? Um, a good introduction or a good overview section of the WSI can really set that out for all the parties. As a consultant, we're dealing with a client. We sit in the space between the planning archaeologists and then the archaeological contractor. So we like to see a WSI which really addresses and communicates the work to all of those parties. So we've got an example, which I'm not going to read, thankfully, um, on the right there. It's from a project um, outside Lincoln, but it clearly sets out who's commissioning the work and who is preparing the WSI. And that can be linked in, in the quality kind of pages of the WSI. When you're, writing, when you're, when you're naming the person who's written it and you're giving their qualifications, their competency, um, it sets out what the project or the development is. It gives a general location. It sets the plan in context. Now, in this case, there'd been pre-application uh, consultation, which triggered the scheme of work. Um, and it also sets out the archaeological context. It's important to have that there, as we've discussed this morning. And it sets out the results of the previous work. I think with the planning context, often, as we've said, sometimes they're reactive to a condition. Sometimes we see a WSI that just says the work has been implemented in, uh, as a result of an archaeological condition, but it never actually says what the condition is. We would always try and put the full word of your condition in there. It sets out the requirements. It might set out the techniques, that you know, the broad techniques, like trial trenching, whether it's a washing reef, and it would also set out some of the reporting requirements for the project. So we always like to see that up front. Um, and then probably not in the example on the right there, but something we would hope to see is who will be undertaking the investigation. Now, sometimes when it's pre, uh, when we're doing it for tender, we won't be able to name the contractor because they haven't won the work yet. So really we would be stipulating there that it would be an RAO organization. Um, and then finally, we've got a statement of what the WSI defines in terms of it setting out the fieldwork scope, the specification and the reporting. So hopefully once 
you've set that out at the start of the document, you're already guiding the planning archaeologist, the contractor, as to the focus and the purpose of the work that's being undertaken. Something we don't often see in a lot of the WSIs we review is a clear statement of the roles and responsibilities. Perhaps it's a, a hangover from my work on large infrastructure schemes where there are a lot of different uh, interested parties and stakeholders, but it's really beneficial for the clients, the contractors, undertaking the construction work if you're actually integrated in the construction programme, um, the archaeological contractors, to define those roles and responsibilities. So again, I won't read out the whole example on the right, but um, what this one does is it clearly defines the parties involved in delivering the archaeological excavate or archaeological investigation. So we've got a principal contractor, we've got an archaeological contractor, and then we've got an ACAL. So each of those roles are there. You can also use it to clarify some of the contractual arrangements without regurgitating the whole contract. So here we can see that the principal contractor is going to appoint the archaeological contractor and they're going to appoint the ACAL. So those relationships and reporting lines have already set out and it clearly identifies the responsibilities of each of the, of the parties there. So the archaeological contractor is going to prepare site-specific written schemes of investigation and they are going to undertake all of the archaeological work both on-site and off-site recording and reporting. And then we've got the ACAL who's going to monitor the works on behalf of the principal contractor. And I think you should also really be adding here, and we've touched on it uh, in terms of underneath the archaeological contractor there, the planning archaeologist, their role. Are they going to approve the WSI? Are they going to come out and monitor the work? And are they going to sign off the work at the end? Not always on all schemes, but it's something you should really be considering. We're moving rapidly on. Um, we've talked about, or sorry, Matt talked about archaeological background. Um, and it is really, I think it's really important. It does give a focus and it does give the background to the archaeological contractor undertaking the work. It also demonstrates to the planning archaeologists that whoever's designed and written that WSI, that they have understood the known archaeology and the potential of the site and that the WSI is a, a proper and appropriate response to that resource. Um, so we'd be looking for something that, um, as we said, is the opportunity to confirm the archaeological context and the purpose of the investigations uh, in the WSI, that it gives a clear overview of the archaeological resource, and that you know, through doing that, you're going to inform the selection of the investigation methods, the aims, objectives, and including the scope of work. Um, in the days of GIS, it's very easy to collate all that information, especially on multi-stage multi schemes. Smaller schemes, you might only have a DBA, on larger projects, you know, invariably you'll have you know, geophysical survey data, you'll have LIDAR data, and you can collate all of that and really helps with the design process. Setting out the aims and research objectives, it's one of these sections of a WSI that can be generic, it can be you know, that template that everybody always uses. So we do look for a clear and concise set of aims to define the purpose of the investigation. They should be site specific, as I say, rather than generic. They should draw on the known archaeological resource and they will inform the methodology, the recording and recovery message that you set out in WSI. So the example there on the right is reasonably generic with a bit of change of the wording. It could apply to a variety of investigations. In this case, it was trial trenching, um, but you know, it's fairly good, it sets out what we're trying to achieve, it sets out the understanding you're trying to gain, but it isn't really site specific. Um, so this is an example of some specific aims where we went further. Um, this was on a second stage of trial trenching, so there already had been trial trenching. The potential for um, Roman pottery production on this site was known, and the first phase of trial trenching had identified that. So we were trying to build on that existing knowledge and further the understanding of the site, you know, the archaeology and the consequences of the archaeology. Um, so you can see some of those later points are actually looking to inform the following mitigation stage and the sampling strategies and the, the artifact recovery strategy so that you're really collecting the data from the site that is gonna, you're going to get the most benefit from. And I think 
everybody's pretty much mentioned the research objectives. It is a requirement of the standard to draw on those. So for this um, site outside Lincoln, where we had the, the Roman pottery production, it drew on the East Midlands research. So we were looking at the regional. There had been consultation with the planning archaeologists and drew, you know, kind of drilled down to these objectives. Um, and again, this will provide a focus for the archaeological contractor. And again, it's demonstrating to your planning archaeologist that you've understood the site, that you are looking to gain the most understanding, that you've got a focused direction and purpose for the investigation. The next part I wanted to talk about was the scape of work. Um, again, it can be quite generic or it can be quite brief in some of the WSIs I've been reviewing lately because they're more interested in getting to the actual nuts and bolts of the methodology. Um, but a clearly defined and quantifiable scope is key to enabling the contractors to provide an accurate tender for the work. So as a consultant, we often write documents or have to review documents that have been prepared for tender. And to gain that understanding, you're going to get, for your client, you're going to get a more accurate cost, a more reasonable cost, and you're going to start to manage the risk of the project and their programme for them. Um, provides all parties with a clear understanding of the work that will be undertaken. So it enables any change of scope to be measured. So we're going back to that requirement in the standard and guidance, you know, of understanding, having a benchmark. This, time, this is in terms of delivery, um, of managing change. Um, you can demonstrate that the works are proportionate and appropriate by looking at the scale of the work you're undertaking. Um, and it also is a guide, you know, a fundamental guide for when you're actually outside on site monitoring the works. Has the works actually been completed to scope? Have they actually done what we set out to do? And if you're writing them well, you can start to re reinforce the purpose and the required outcomes of the work. So we've got an example at the bottom there. It's fairly basic, small 20 trench evaluation. It says how many trenches there are. It says their size and it gives a location plan or a reference to a location plan. It's OK, but we would really try to move beyond that. A much fuller example here. We're still setting out those, you know, quantifying that work in the same way. It's 20 trenches. We've said how, how big they are. But we're saying adding the sample size and we're adding the size of the site so that the planning archaeologists can assess whether that work is proportionate to the archaeology we're identifying as or potential archaeology in the site. We're including a contingency, but we're not just saying it's a further 1% and leaving everybody to guess what that is. We're actually quantifying that as 500 square metres or five trenches measuring five or two. Um, we're saying why that contingency would be implemented. And we're also saying here with the, the conditions under which that would be implemented. So in consultation with the local authority, sort of environment officer and following approval by the client. So we're also acknowledging there's a contractual element to that as well. Um, the stating in terms of the design without trying to unravel the whole process that we've been through because some assurance that we've actually placed the trenches in considered and targeted locations so they've been you know, they've been in a position to avoid the known site constraints um, that they're targeted on the areas of highest development impact in this case and that uh, where they're applicable the anomalies uh, sorry they're targeting anomalies identified by the previous geophysical survey. So again, we're demonstrating that we have an understanding of what's already happened on the site. We're building on that. And we're, you know, we're really highlighting whether there are any constraints onto what we can do. So again, everybody can make an informed judgment on whether the work is appropriate, whether it's proportionate, and ultimately whether you're going to achieve the outcomes that you want. I think you can further enhance that by just including a simple, simple table Trench numbers, dimensions, a depth. Sometimes we've already identified colluvium, alluvium. Are you digging to the right depth? So you're setting out what you want from the project and from the work. Um, the final column is really kind of enhancing the, you know, reinforcing the targeting nature or targeted nature of the work, perhaps. But also, it's emphasising the purpose of on a trench by trench basis of what we're doing. So it's very clear for the contractor, it's very clear for the planning archaeologist, and 
uh, for the client as well. And just some examples there might be targeting LIDAR features, um, geophysical anomalies, or if you're at a very early stage, it can just be presence or absence and significance of the archaeology. Equally applicable when we're doing detailed excavation, the mitigation stage, identifying the area, size, perhaps coordinates, um, and again, a reason. There's known archaeology on the site, and we're going in to make a record of that archaeology. So the purpose is reinforced. Just very quickly, I know we haven't got a lot of time, um, pick up on the methodology. It's one of those sections where, again, templates come into play, and you can see a lot of repeated uh, information from one project to the next. You know, they should provide a clear methodology for each of the techniques or stages of the work to be undertaken. Often on larger schemes, you're writing a WSI with multiple phases of work, geophysical survey, trial trenching, perhaps there's geoarchological borehole survey in there as well. So you want a clear method for each of those techniques and each of the activities within that. So there should be you know, setting out of the trenches, machine excavation, hand excavation and recording. They should be appropriate for the aims. So if you've set out a good set of aims at the beginning of the document, that's going to be a golden thread that filters through to the methodology. And again, it allows the person reviewing the WSI to understand that the techniques are appropriate, that they are proportionate, and that they are going to achieve the outcomes that you want in terms of furthering the understanding of the site and the significance of the remains and how that will inform either a planning decision or the design of a development. And then, again, benchmarking, we want to provide a clear and measurable quantifiable sampling strategy. There's just an example there, very basic from some trial trenching that uh, a WSI that we reviewed. It sets out the type of features that are anticipated on the site and the percentage. So when you're actually on site monitoring, you can refer back to this. And again, it, it's emphasizing and giving the confidence to your planning archeologist that you are undertaking work that is actually gonna achieve the aims. Quick word on environmental sampling. Um, it's one of the sections of the report that can be generic, can come out of that template, but it's also something that doesn't want to be too prescriptive. As a consultant, if we're writing it, we're not going to be undertaking it. And we need to leave some space for the archaeological contractor to use their expertise and their specialist knowledge. But really, it should be identifying the types of archaeological remains that are predicted or known to be on the site and how they can contribute to the interpreting and understanding the site and its significance. They should make a clear contribution to the aims and objectives that you've already set out should provide at least an overview of the method uh, of sample recovery. It should reference the relevant professional guidance. And when we're reviewing WSIs, it's making sure that the guidance is actually up to date and current. As the example, top corner isn't. Um, it should identify any specialist inputs that are required on site. So is it geoarchological specialists, perhaps? You should be undertaking the sampling or advising on the sampling. And ideally, it should provide a clear and measurable sampling strategy. So this uh, is quite a nice example that we've seen um, in the WSI. So it's identifying the different types of uh, environmental data, child plant remains, waterlogged and organic remains, small bones. It's setting out the methods of recovery in a broad term, so bulk sampling, incremental sampling or monoliths. It sets out the feature types that we could expect to be sampling. Um, the sample size based on standards and guidance and it's also linked to the excavation strategy there so looking at the percentage that we've already uh, set out in the previous section yeah for the what you're going to excavate for those features having a clear environmental sample strategy is really important having that focus for the contractor is important controlling the cost for your client is important because i think we've all been on sites where we see hundreds of white buckets They've all got to be processed, they've all got to be paid for, and at the end of the day, if you're not taking the right environmental samples, you're not going to gain the information you want that is going to inform the understanding and the significance of the site. Um, very briefly, deliverables. I know I'm skipping bits, not, not intending to do a section-by-section section 
and a guide to writing a WSI. Um, there is clear guidance out in the standard and guidance for reporting. If we're looking and reviewing a WSI, what we would hope to see is that it reflects those standards and any planning or project specific requirements. So does the planning condition specify there's got to be a process assessment? Is that included? In terms of project specific requirements, do we need an interim report so that decisions can be made before the final report is submitted in terms of the next stage of archaeological work or to inform the design perhaps? Um, should set out clear time timelines for each deliverable required from the completion of the work and should set out the content of each deliverable and how that will fulfil the aims and communicate the outcomes of the work. In terms, firmly with a, a consultant's hat on, in terms of measuring the work and the, the progress of the investigation, monitoring or weekly reporting is, is a really key element to see in the WSI. Um, in terms of monitoring visits, who will monitor? Usually it's the planning archaeologist, perhaps the client, perhaps principal contractor. Uh, what's the frequency of the visits? Can ensure that the record from those meetings and any outcomes, any actions are recorded. Progress reporting. Very often see that an email or telephone um, update will be given on request. That doesn't really um, control or provide regular information for the interested parties on the site, whether it's the client, whether it's the uh, planning archaeologist, or in our role as a consultant, or you know, perhaps an archaeological clerk of work. So what format is that going to take? Normally we would expect to see a written, short written document. What information is going to be provided? Is there going to be a progress update? It's going to quantify the work that's been completed. It's going to summarise the results and the significance of any remains that have been found. It's going to notify of any change to scope. Is there an early warning going to be raised, for example, on certain types of contract? Are there site constraints? Has, have you not been able to access part of the site? How is that going to affect the, for, you know, the coming programme or any other issues? And a look ahead for the next week so everybody knows where the work is moving to. Um, finally, sign off and completion. Sometimes it's as simple as notifying the client that you've completed the work um, and you're moving on to report writing. Other times it's you're handing the work back to a farmer or perhaps to a principal contractor who then is going to move into the site immediately behind you. So how is that sign off of the investigation actually going to happen? Is it going to be a, a one page pro forma? Is it going to be an email notification? Does it need to be signed off by other parties, planning archaeologists? Does it need to be signed off by the principal contractor? Um, and what's the timeline for that prompt notification? It's no good waiting for completion for weeks and weeks. Um, I'm really aware that in the time given, I've missed out a lot of the content of the WSI. I've missed out uh, public engagement and outreach. I've missed out the archiving. Um, but there are two important aspects that I would always expect to see in the WSI. One of those is health and safety. You know, there's a number of points there which might be included. Certainly the responsibilities. If there's a principal contractor on site, they're responsible for the overall um, coordination of health and safety on the site, but the archaeological contractor has that duty to their staff and that they undertake the work safely. Are there other health and safety documents that aren't necessarily included in the WSI that need, or they, they could be appended or they're, you know, perhaps signposts where they are found? Site specifics, PPE, CSCS cards required, and are there any kind of site specific evacuation or, you know, fire drill procedures that need to be included? And then site constraints. They're kind of fundamental to the design process and need to be thought of as you're actually planning the work, but they also need to be stated, especially for the archaeological contractor. Um, buried overhead services and utilities is obviously a key one, but we've already seen there can be problems with land access, um, ecological constraints, agricultural constraints, and then you know, it can be simple as sensitive neighbours. Um, you know, we don't want to disturb them. It could impinge the work or they could come out and complain. So really, I hope that gives some idea of how you can write a decent WSI that is actually fit for purpose, that does have a focus and that does set out the methods and the techniques that are going to be used um, to fulfil the outcomes of the work. Uh, and hopefully that will just give you something to think about as you move into the workshop.